Mr. Derek Veenhoff. He's better known as Deke. Drinking liquor with DJ Deke, we out laughing. Yo, Deke. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome back to the show. This is Deke, your host. I'm here with Yuri Dagan. Yuri, how's it going, man? Thanks. Yeah, it's good. Yuri, you're a guy with a lot of interests, a lot of uh, expertise. Now, your main thing is you're a life extension activist. Um, you're a biotech entrepreneur. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your academic background or what the work that you do? Start sure. I guess actually the main thing is like longevity uh, drug development because I mean activism I've been doing for many years but like the past few years I've actually been focusing on creating a therapy creating a gene therapy for longevity that can hopefully radically extend lifespan Uh, so my background is in drug development I've been doing regular non-longevity drug development for the past uh, 11 years now actually almost 12 Um, and uh, before that, I was in IT. I have an IT background. Uh, and uh, then I switched over to pharmaceutical, uh, you know, business development, but basically anything to do with commercializing uh, drug discovery. And uh, then I moved into longevity and have been, has been doing longevity drug development for you know, many years. But actually, the gene therapy stuff I've been doing since 2017. So here I am. Yeah, and so I have a lot of questions about longevity in general, but of course we have other topics we're going to get into too. We have you've been vocal on Twitter with uh, ivermectin that discussion around the Weinstein and his podcast and that kind of thing, and then of course you wrote a popular piece on Medium about the lab leak theory, which uh, you're a proponent of. You believe that that's your most likely um, scenario in your mind. Of course, there are many people to disagree. And even on this show, we've had discussions with skeptics and this and that and on either side or whatever. And so I was stoked to get to um, have you expand on that. But uh, with longevity, like, is there a sort of miracle drug or a switch that we're going to hit? Or is it more of um, smaller, minute changes that a drug might give over time? Like, what, what are the goals and challenges there? Well, the goal is miracle drug, miracle gene therapy that will just stop the aging process and hopefully even help us reverse it. Uh, well, it's a miracle only be- until you actually do it. <laughs> As you know, I, I forgot who said it, that uh, to, I guess, a person from the past, the modern technology is indistinguishable from magic. So maybe it was Feynman. I, f- I forget. But uh, yeah, so like many therapies we have right now, or even gene therapies that to regular people that would seem like magic, like somebody has a genetic defect and you you correct the genetic defect and all of a sudden the person is normal and it looks like a miracle. Or even, I don't know, antibiotics used to be viewed as a miracle. Like people were dying from these terrible diseases and all it takes is just one pill and actually there's no more terrible disease. Or ivermectin from like river blindness. People were dying from river blindness and it turns out it was just a parasite causing that. Mm. That blindness, you take, you know, one pill and you're magically cured. So it's only like magic when you don't know the underlying science. But in terms of aging, I think we're getting, uh, we, we don't know yet how it works com- exactly, but we're, we're narrowing down to some of the proximal causes. And I think it's very much epigenetically driven. So I think any therapy that will be able to address the underlying epigenetic a- nature of aging, as we're trying to do, hopefully we'll be able to provide uh, you know, great increases in lifespan. Of course, I have to be very careful because until we actually can validate these hypotheses in first in animals and then in humans, these are, you know, worth just, you know, as much as my educated opinion is worth. So we don't actually have yet, uh, well, we, we have some preliminary data in animals, but I don't want to oversell it. But I mean, ultimately, there's nothing stopping humanity from solving this biological problem. It's just a biological problem like any other. There's no underlying reason why we can't live many, many times longer as other animals do, like whales live for 200 years. Uh, Some sharks live for 400 years. So trees Mm -hmm. live for thousands of years. So there's nothing fundamentally about biology that makes you have to die at a certain age. And it's just a matter of figuring out how we actually, you know, get to the biology that we want instead of the biology that we kind of have or been kind of unlucky to have. So um, 
there was another part of your question that already. Well, forgot. so I guess like one of the challenges, like so, are the phenomena that you're trying to stop do cell degradation, cell death? Like, are those the sort of um, how does aging manifest? Is that how you think of it? Well, a, a little bit kind of upstream of that. Basically, the manifestations of aging that we see, like you know, muscle atrophy or the decrease in the ability of our cells to actually repair themselves or to prevent you know bad damage from accumulating in cells. Basically, all of this is downstream from the um, epigenetic downregulation of all the machinery in our bodies that is able to actually prevent this. And so we're, we're going after this down regulation part. We're trying to prevent the genes that are basically responsible for doing the good stuff, prevent them from being dark, down regulated with age. And I mean, this is, there's no question about this down regulation. This is, this is a scientific fact. Now the question is how we, can we actually prevent this? Can we actually do it safely? Can we find mechanisms to, because there's so many things that get downregulated with age and there's also bad things that get upregulated with age. And so the kind of the tricky thing is to find the, the balance between, you know, letting the good ones stay upregulated and not letting the bad ones get upregulated. And so, uh, yeah, basically our approach is to kind of reuse what nature uses for this purpose, which is human factors, and uh, try to kind of hack our biology to get the benefits of the human factors without getting all the negative stuff that we could get from mm -hmm. it. You know, in the media and stuff, it feels like uh, we've only heard of this type of science for maybe like a decade or maybe two decades. Like, is this just scratching the surface as far as, you know, we've heard about CRISPR and gene editing and these things. And, uh, you know, is there a lot of ways to go before we reach some of these major goals with long, uh, life extension? Well, the things that we hear, they're tools. They're tools to manipulate biology, like CRISPR, like gene editing, like you know, many other things you hear. And it's it's not about the tools, it's about how to use the tools. Like the tools are there. Like once we figure out which genes we can maybe use to do our bidding, to do like the upregulation, or even Yamanaka genes, we might be able to get away with already what genes we know to be able to slow down this, you know, down regulation of good stuff. And the, the tools are there. It's, it's a matter of like first, once you figure out what to do, doing it is very easy. It's a very easy engineering challenge at this point because we already like have so much accumulated knowledge about gene therapy. And like there's already over 300 different gene therapies in clinical trials, in humans. So this is not, you know, something way, way in the future. It's, it's the tools are there. The tools are good. It's a, it's a matter of figuring out what to, you know, what to use those tools for. And that for aging, that, as I mentioned, uh, you know, before, it's, it's still a bit of a, you know, uncharted territory. There's still some things that we don't understand about the aging process. And we don't really understand completely how to manipulate it. We have this kind of hack that partial reprogramming by Yamanaka factors might be able to kind of do this for us without us completely understanding what's going on. I mean, we're, we're digging and it's not just us. It's like the wider scientific community is digging at those things from different angles, trying to understand like what exactly happens during reprogramming. What are the different like cell fates that can occur during reprogramming? And where is the, like the, the Goldilocks zone where you already have rejuvenation in your reprogram, partial reprogram cells, but you don't yet have the bad stuff. Like you, you still haven't lost the function of the, of the cells that you've reprogrammed. So it's just a matter of, um, research and development of trying to like propagate all this knowledge to the point of where it actually can be used as a therapy, something safe and something efficacious. And uh, even if in the beginning we might have uh, kind of uh, not huge gains in lifespan, not huge gains in rejuvenation, it's a good starting point because basically anything you can get uh, right now is, 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 is great because it also could help you kind of live long enough for the next big, big thing. And this is like what, right. you know, Aubrey de Grey calls longevity escape velocity. You kind of live long enough, just longer, a little bit longer to get to the next stage and the next stage and the next stage. And maybe, you know, in 30 years, there'll be like a huge breakthrough that will essentially stop all aging. Essentially, maybe we'll even be able to rejuvenate you by 10 years, 20 years. And it's just a matter of actually getting yourself there. Mm -hmm. And even small gains, towards that goal are uh, could be critical for you to get there.
Yeah, what comes to mind to me is uh, William Shatner, how he takes like 100 pills a day, uh, like Ray Kurzweil, I think the same thing. Maybe I saw that in the same documentary, but um, are these guys wasting their time taking all these, or is it just vitamins and stuff? It's like... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to be dismissive because, I mean, I was doing similar stuff when I was a biohacker before <laughs> I actually like completely dove into the the science behind like each supplement basically you know it sounds great and there's some mouse data for it and then you kind of uh, this is actually a good tie into this ivermectin bullshit because there's just so many bullshit studies bullshit being like it's an animal study there's some effect and of course they publish the study because they publish all the good stuff and they don't publish the 20 studies they've done or someone else did where there was no effect from this drug on in this animal model. And so you kind of get fooled into believing that like this is all vitamin D is going to make me much more, I don't know, younger and more uh, versatile, or prevent me from catching COVID and all these wonderful things or Evermectin or, uh, I don't know, Corsetin, which is like a uh, synolytic and all of a sudden, I, I see it popping up in this uh, core, Pierre Corey protocol, the frontline COVID whatever bullshit. Like quercetin was popular in, I mean, it's still popular in the anti-aging circles for, I don't know, since five years ago when there was like properties of it in uh, as a senolytic because it kills senescent cells. And people are like, oh, you know, senescent cells are the reason of age, for aging or the primary or the main, not main, like... Uh, one of the main reasons for aging, let's take some senolytics, kill some senescent cells, and we're going to live so much longer. And um, basically, there was an animal study, a mouse study that, you know, showed some senolytic extending, you know, murine lifespan by like 25% to 30% Baker study. But uh, anyways, I get off. On, no, on that's fine. Oh, so what about, uh, <laughs> you know how they talk about these blue zones with a certain like Singapore and what is it, Tokyo, certain cities, whatever the people, is that just a sort of aggregate statistic phenomenon or is there really something to, you know, they always used to say, well, it's because of the Mediterranean diet or it's yeah, because yeah. of the rice they eat or whatever. Is yeah, that, is it's it? all just bullshit in my view. <laughs> it was basically kind of you, I, I guess you, you do the mistake correlation for causation. And even like those blue zones, they're not that much, they don't live that much longer. Right, it's just like a little bit. Small to, effect. Yeah. yeah. Right. They're like, oh, it's the diet. And then there's so many like vastly different things between all those blue zones, like uh, Greece, Japan, uh, Sardinia. They're like trying to put a common denominator. like, oh, it's the family, man. Like they have ties to the family and that makes them want to live longer. And that's, that's why they live longer. Yeah, or like religious community aspects very, or something. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. doesn't sound very scientific to me. And mm -hmm. even then, yeah, like, so it's, uh, they're living a little bit longer, but they're not, you know, younger. And this is not something that we're after. We're after radical rejuvenation because right. I don't want to live, you know, 10 years longer as an old and decrepit dude. Right, right. If, right. And have if all there's these anything, issues. Yeah. yeah, if there's anything I, I want as a therapy, it's something that will give me, much better health for much longer and maybe even better health than I have right now, like actually rejuvenating other, other than otherwise, I think I don't, it's not worth it. Like right. the, these therapies, I think they're not like, they should be, we should be after radical life extension. Not just like, Oh, we're going to live five years longer and die a little healthier. Sure. Which is like what? <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. And do you face any criticism these days from like sort of the religious groups, you know, that always seemed like a playing God thing, but the people really, not care anymore like you know uh, once they realize yeah. life extension means that they could live longer maybe they <laughs> yeah i haven't faced any kind of religious criticism in a while mm -hmm. i mean well, you know, once in a while there's just some kind of religious not popping up but uh, you know it's just like such low level of intelligence in their criticism it's not even <laughs> worth addressing right so. who cares yeah now so of course these other big topics and i guess they're somewhat related but the lab leak hypothesis as well as this brett weinstein and ivermectin thing um right. they're related in the sense for you because i think you were on the weinstein podcast uh, speaking initially about the lab leak stuff um um but then of course you've been very critical of him uh, and others for the recent talk about ivermectin so i don't know is, where do you want to go first <laughs> more about vaccines probably less than ivermectin i was more mad about him kind of throwing shade on vaccines and mm -hmm. using ivermectin as an alternative uh than i was just about you know ivermectin but i mean it's really kind of interconnected 
uh, where do I want to go first? I mean, it's up to you. I can. Well, let me, let me try and I'll try and summarize what I think your view is. And then you can correct me if I'm wrong. Cause what I've yeah. gathered is you personally think that it's about 90% sure or accurate that there was some sort of lab leak in Wuhan. Um, and it relates to she, um, finding that, um, that, uh, initial, what is it? Backbone you call it or whatever it was, from that mine. And that the, because of, um, the various, uh, indi- indicators of cover ups and the emails from, uh, Fauci and well, sorry, that's a jumping a little bit, but with respect to Wuhan, the, the to you, the evidence stacks up that it was a lab leak. And because, because for one, we haven't found the animal or any evidence that really shows that it uh, was a zoonotic uh, origin. And then combine that with the fact that you believe there is some conspiratorial sort of cover up from Fauci and the, the WHO team to sort of um, poo poo the idea of lab leak entirely, take it off the table because they, you know, there, there must be something that they know there. Uh, does that sort of summarize? Your view, not not scientifically speaking, but sort of roughly the outline. Yeah, yeah pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of yeah, course, there's people who disagree with you. I mean, uh, you're familiar with, obviously, this week in virology and all these sort of virology experts that sort of, you know, are in the Twitter sphere. You might whatever. have heard about them a little You've bit. Might have, okay. And so, again, you're much deeper into this than I. And I'm just a layman. Like, I don't really understand the science behind it. I did try to read your 16,000 word uh, medium post on uh, the science behind it. And of course, a guy like me or like the average person out there will get lost after a few paragraphs, right? Um, what Logically, what what is hard for me to understand is, you know, when I'm trying to sift through the information, I see guys like James Dewar, Dewar I forget how you say his name. He's a virologist that um, made a lot of points that uh, on a big Reddit post that basically when you, your points sort of are the almost polar opposite of his, like he talks about the cleavage site and uh, he talks about the mosaic versus the chimera aspect. Whereas you are sort of like on the opposite end, like he's saying it's not a chimera, it's a mosaic. Whereas you're saying it's a clear, it's an obvious chimera. Does that make sense? Sure. And yeah, yeah. The doer guy, I actually, uh, I actually called him out on a couple of points of criticism on Twitter just I don't know, a month ago. Mm. He had some bullshit criticism. I like, tried to ask him for the evidence of those and he never responded but yeah he had this huge document that's try to like go point by point yeah not even all about my media market but just in general all sorts of yeah. like why he thinks it's not a lab leak and why it must be natural but uh it's it's really like that's the i think the point of all of these criticisms of the kind of the zoonotic crowd is they take each kind of suspicious thing that you say, well, this is suspicious, like this furin cleavage size is suspicious. And they're like, it could have happened in nature. And so they're like individually, all the things that we point out, yeah, they could have happened in nature. But when you take them in, in totality, collectively, like this is such a huge coincidence that I think a much more plausible explanation to the totality of all the circumstantial evidence is a lab leak rather than like each individual one, you know, saying, oh yeah, it could have happened in nature, but then how did it get to Wuhan? Like, where, where's the intermediate host? Why does it exhibit this? Why doesn't it ba- bind to bat receptors? Why does it do this or that? And usually like they don't engage in uh, that kind of response of analyzing the totality of things. They always just go point by point. And uh, I mean, nobody is denying that it could have happened. It, yeah, you know, I just want to make it clear. Like I was, I was impressed when I heard you in one interview where you somebody tried to almost um, um, set you up to say, "Yeah, I know I'm 100 percent right." Where you said, "No, I mean it's it's not been proven yet. I'm just saying that I strongly believe, based on this X Y Z, that uh, you know it's a lab leak." And of course, in all these interviews and discussions, it it does always come down to the plausibility aspect, the probability aspect, and you're going to have experts on on both sides listing their reasons and then the other side is just going to say well that's not plausible to me all right and then i guess you do you could look at let's say pick virologists i suppose and look at i believe most of them are on one side but again it's 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 we don't have evidence in either way and people have asked what is the smoking gun for each side and i guess for zoonotic it would be the animal right have for sars one did they find 
the whole thing? Yeah, they found one like w- within four months or maybe even within weeks. I mean, within four months, they published it. Yeah. But it was very quick. They're like, okay, these dudes ate this Palms vet in this <laughs> animal restaurant. Uh, they, they just, then they go into the market selling Palms vets. They analyze Palms vets, collect samples. Of, oh, wow, look, 99.6% identical virus in those Palms vets to the one that infected the humans. Yeah, yeah, it was very quick. And it's usually very quick when it's in a zoonotic jump, like camels with MERS, uh, Ebola uh, with that kid that, I don't even know, he ate a bat or something. Right, yeah, like right. it's, it's pretty, Sometimes I mean, they don't though, right? Is it not, the Spanish flu, is that the one where they still don't know the origin or? Well, I mean, we're talking modern methods. Sure. <laughs> they don't yeah, they couldn't have, they didn't have, yeah. In they had like divination yeah. sticks back then and stuff. Like they didn't, yeah. is. Well, it's, yeah, so it's interesting. It's it's a tough discussion because, like I said, the average person doesn't really know how to sift through the information. And I think what happened was, like you're saying, that uh, it's not almost fair to the argument that they dismissed it so early in the process and yeah, so, like so adamantly. Anderson, like, but then other people also were saying, well, you know, Trump's saying we we know it's from a lab leak, and the, the intelligence agents are saying that they they know. And it's like, well, there was never any evidence of that either. There's just again the plausibility aspect depending on your argument. So it does seem like you know, for both sides, it's been a long time coming. There should be something, you know, or are you saying that there is maybe some evidence out there on, on either side, but perhaps for some reason it's uh, covered up or like, is the, is the argument that it's China that is covering something up or is the WHO covering something up or because this all relates to gain of function too, right. And how you, um, right. No, it's obviously China that would be covering up a lab leak. And WHO is kind of their pocket useful fool who they can manipulate and make it seem as if there has been a proper investigation. But even now, WHO is like not being wo- not willing to remain their useful fool. And even Mbarak himself is like uh, kind of spilling the beans on the behind the scenes negotiation with China. Is like, don't put that lab leak stuff in the report. And it's like, we can't not put that in the report. That's pretty much why we're here. And uh, so many things also they mentioned, like it's very suspicious during that uh, trip to, to, to China. But um, I mean, all of them have huge conflicts of interest. Like virologists uh, have huge, like Dashek <laughs> leading the investigation is like the most blatant conflict of interest you could ever have. Because he's the guy funding that research in Wuhan that potentially could have resulted in this lab leak. And uh, like mm. he's the guy uh, orchestrating the Lancet letter in February of 2020. Like, what do you, how do you, can you tell that this is not a lab leak two months after the outbreak? Nobody has investigated anything. How can you dismiss it so early? Right. And also, Christian Anderson, like, very odd that initially, like, all I think. Uh, reasonable virologists, when they just look at the genome at first, like, whoa, this kind of suspicious. So did Christian Anderson, so did Eddie Holmes. And then Fauci has a teleconference in which he pulls in Eddie Holmes and Christian Anderson. And all of a sudden, they like completely flip their position, like, no, totally natural, not suspicious. Like, Eddie Holmes was 80% certain that it's lab leak. Christian Anderson was between like 40 and 30, uh, 40 and 50, if I remember correctly, before that call. And after that call, like, they all very almost certain it's it's a zoonotic event so i mean so to me it's completely obvious conflict of interest and people covering their ass starting from fauci from the top and then it kind of trickles down to whoever doesn't want to get on fauci's kind of bad side and nobody wants to get on fauci's bad side if you're a virologist so yeah and i mean again um people will counter these ideas with that whole uh concept of whistleblowing and you know with enough time there should be some sort of whistleblowing that goes on even within china that there should be some evidence of you know um it's hard it is hard to cover things up especially with a lot of people right but uh i believe you have counter ideas to that as well well i don't know the 1977 lab leak has been uh, no, no whistleblower ever came forward, but we're pretty certain it was a lab leak. What was? Uh, I'm not familiar the, with that one. What was that again? What? This is like, I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not an expert. Like haven't me, right? been following the lab leak very closely because there was an outbreak in 1977, pandemic, a flu pandemic that okay. killed like 700,000 people, 
And it's, it was a lab leak. Like, uh, there's almost certainty in the scientific community that it was caused by a lab leak. Most that was the Asian flu they called it back then, or whatever it was called? Was it originally no, that in one Asia? wasn't. I think that one was called the Russian flu, because oh, okay. initially they, uh, like, they uh, noticed it in the Far East in Russia. Mm -hmm. So they called it the Russian flu, but then uh, later on, and then they kind of, there were weird, uh, 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 the genome of that strain was very close to the 1950s strain. Like, it, if it was a natural thing, you couldn't have that such a close Id identity between the two strains. So obviously, uh, a lab leak would explain it. Basically, if it's a lab leak of 1950s strain that was stored in the lab, that explained perfectly why they're so close. The, the pandemic strain and the, and the strain that was previously held in labs. And also the temperature sensitivity. For some reason, it was a temperature sensitive uh, kind of strain of a virus that is usually what is done for vaccine attenuation. The vaccine attenuation is used as a temperature sensitivity to make the virus kind of less uh, virulent and uh, like basically make it more of a more of a live vaccine rather than a live virus. But basically, they didn't attenuate it well enough, and it just you know started propagating and, and killing a lot of people, and mostly young people who weren't like who didn't have exposure to the strain of the virus like back from because it, it disappeared from from the world for, like i think last time it was before 1977 i, I think like 1947 was the last time it was seen or 1950s and so it was really weird that it like magically reappeared and initially everybody was like denying that it's a lab like who was standing up for china was like no they didn't have the strain in their lab so it must be not a lab leak and only like after years passed and our instruments of genetic analysis improved. Like really in, in the 2000s have scientists kind of been able to reanalyze it and agree that, yeah, this is a lab leak. Like, no doubt about it. Right. So the point another is great there, example, there, there's been another one. Yep. Yeah. There's been plenty of lab leaks and plenty of lab leaks has been, have been denied. And still to this day, nobody kind of admitted it uh, for the 1977 lab leak, but there was a lab leak in 1979 in Russia, in Sverdlovsk, anthrax lab leak, killed like 60, 66 people, not a big deal, but still everybody was like initially also denying, like, no, 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 no lab leak, totally natural, just an accident. And they brought in like foreign experts to Russia, uh, very reminiscent of this WHO investigation, and those foreign experts were given access to Russian scientists, Soviet scientists, who like convinced them that no, no, not from our lab, no, no, not a lab leak. And then Yeltsin in '92, like I don't know, was like, was he feeling drunk or something? He's like, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that was a lab leak. I was in Sverdlovsk. I was a part of the official in Sverdlovsk at that time. I helped cover it up. So yeah, it was a lab leak. And yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> so basically, yeah, if. If there's like this, this thesis like somebody will step forward is complete bullshit because mm, why would no? Uh, there's uh, very little incentive for people to step forward, especially like from totalitarian. Uh, oh, countries. true, right? Yeah, I mean, so yeah, you're risking your that. life for what? Just to let the world know that you fucked up. <laughs> so it's it's probably yeah. not. Uh, so very, to summarize, very obviously, yeah, obviously, I'm not equipped uh, to really even debate about the topic in general. But uh, to summarize at least your motives, I mean, uh, whether it was with, the, you know, zoonotic or, or a lab leak, I think your motive is tied to your, um, your thoughts about life extension and, and COVID and life uh, death prevention, really. Um, no. You, you don't, well, no, but <laughs> My I'm motive saying in figuring out what the source is. No, I'm just saying that you, or you what motive? I would say you have an altruistic motive in, in that you, you want to prevent these things from happening. So, uh, if it's a gain of function well, research, that's... yeah, I'm, I'm I'm really against gain of function. That's, that's kind of what I'm sure. trying to get at. But, yeah, but the kind of the interest in the in the origin of this is really mostly academic or just curiosity, really. Sure. And even if this is not a lab leak, I still think gain of function research in virology should stop immediately, and because there's just it's there's no benefit to it, and there's huge risks. And you're not alone pandemic. in that in that thinking, right? Like, oh, of course, yeah. Richard, Richard Ebright has been kind of spearheading that uh, uh, perspective for for years, even before this. And the many, like the Cambridge Working Group, was telling a lot of uh, virologists, including Fauci, even because it all started, I think, in 2012. That was the first gain of function, like very dangerous experiment that got a lot of people, like uh, a lot of scientists, not a lot of people, because like people at large, they're clueless. They're clueless about the dangers going on in the, in the labs, in virology labs. 
And uh, until there is a pandemic, nobody's interested in learning what actually scientists are doing. But in 2012, they took this flu virus that wasn't transmissible through air, and they passaged it in ferrets and made it transmissible through air. It was a highly pathogenic virus, and people outside of uh, kind of those experiments were telling those scientists, you guys are crazy because you could have a pandemic on your hands just from that strain. So don't do that kind of gain of function stuff because there's really not no benefit of doing so. Okay, you're learning some what mutations cause it, but so what? Like, what's the benefit of it? There's just zero zero benefit, I, but huge risk. Yeah, and, I was going to ask you that. Like, is that because the 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 benefits and the risks, uh, the calculation there? I was just going to say, like, why if it is so dangerous? You know, why do so many people say that it's useful? Um, you know, what's the purpose? Just so that they could learn some sort of breakthrough just by happenstance or? I think because they're just trying to get money to do what they're really curious about. I mean, virologists love this kind of research. I mean, that's sure. why they went, they go into virology. They love to like, I don't know, figure out what makes the virus dangerous. Why don't we make it more dangerous? And we figure out that way True. what happened to it. Like it's the, that's the best. But then you really got to lock happen. the doors. Like you got to. Well, yes, it's, it's, <laughs> there's no safe proof doors, but, but really there's <laughs> zero, zero benefit of learning this stuff other than satisfying virologists' curiosity. There's zero benefit of it. How do they sell this stuff to the public? How do they sell it to grant agencies? They tell you that, oh, once we learn this stuff, we can actually prevent pandemics. We can pr do some preventative vaccine or preventative therapeutics against those bad mutations, which is utter fucking bullshit, okay? Like, this is completely idiotic it completely unsupported by the scientific matter you don't know what's going to jump out of you zoonotically so creating preventative vaccines from your gain of function experiment is completely idiotic idea and but the, the dangers that the dangers are real you can create a pandemic using that gain of function experiment and to have fauci in 2012 pontificate that the risks are worth it like he wrote a paper he's like Gain of function, even if it can cause a pandemic, that risk is worth the knowledge we can gain from gain of function experiments. Complete and utter fucking bullshit. I'm so mad. Like, this is a top epidemiologist saying those things. The guy in charge of, you know, pretty much, I could say, the world public health, like right. definitely American public health. You're making such irresponsible claims that the risk of a pandemic is worth it. It's absolutely responsible. So the grants, not only that, he like pushed through. There was a moratorium they put in place on gain of function, like under Obama. But then Fauci was the one who overturned it single handedly when right. Trump came to power. Came to power, and then he funded that 2017 work in Wuhan, where they created eight different novel chimeric viruses, you know, designed to bind potentially human receptor better. And so, like, if he's not playing with fire, I don't know who is. Hmm. Well, we're going to remain with an open mind. Uh, how about that, Yuri? We're going to at least agree to, uh, you know, see, see what happens, I suppose, with the evidence. Because me, myself, I, I'm, I'm no person to judge. Uh, but, of course, we do appreciate uh, your opinion and your outlook. Now, how can we, uh, how do we solve this Brett Weinstein problem? Is it going to solve itself? <laughs> are, are these people just dumb? Are they malicious? Is it for Patreon money? What's with this ivermectin and anti-vaccine stuff? I don't know, man. I think that, I mean, basically, I think they're coming from a good place, especially initially. They're trying to, uh, maybe they think that the, this heterodoxy uh, or, or the orthodoxy is preventing like the good knowledge from actually coming to people that vaccines are dangerous and they're trying to kind of sound the alarm on, on the dangers of the vaccines. They, they think they have some kind of like superior knowledge to everybody else in the world. Cause that was kind of their thing with the lab leak. Cause uh, you know, uh, I guess initially they also thought, you know, they trusted the scientists trusted the virologist that the you know there's no reason to think that it was a lab leak but then they read my article and they got convinced and we really were a minority in the beginning that you know we we did kind of it wasn't the sacred knowledge but nobody was really willing to look at the evidence that you know it could have been a lab leak and they think it's very similar to this situation where you know i don't know big pharma and big tech and whatever are trying to suppress information for i don't know lining pharma's pockets 
for with money for vaccines that they wouldn't get if ivermectin was actually as effective as as a prophylaxis as vaccines are i don't know like they can have very contorted reasoning for why they're doing this but i mean uh, ultimately what matters is that they're wrong they're completely and utterly wrong about throwing shade on vaccines and about thinking that ivermectin is 100 effective and this has been proven that they're wrong completely wrong already for i don't know a couple of months now and the fact that they're staying with their wrong messaging very dangerous messaging that probably can and did get people killed who trusted that messaging to me that is actually hinting that maybe there is some actual bad faith in there that they're acting uh, out of rather than trying to save lives save the world as they like to kind of spin their messaging around so i don't know man i think I mean, and that's what really pisses me off because i think i might have misjudged brett and heather thinking that there really are just honest truth seekers where they're just this is an act for them maybe to i don't know propagate maybe a subconscious act not necessarily a malicious act but maybe subconsciously they want to think of themselves as these kind of really smart people who kind of get the knowledge that other people don't get but in reality they're not they're not that smart they're not that competent and they're dangerously captured by by their delusions of grandeur where they kind of think that just because they have thousands of subscribers listening to their bullshit all all of a sudden this makes them somehow right it doesn't so yeah and you can look at the gra- my, you can look at the graph of their um patreon support and sort of when they started saying certain things and how the subscribe the subscriber just boom yeah there's a sucker born every minute and there's so many suckers who want to think vaccines are dangerous who who want to justify their hesitancy of you know they're afraid of getting something unknown because they don't know the science and they keep hearing all these other dumb fucks propagate these things like oh man vaccines are dangerous just look at this brett weinstein podcast and they all like kind of go and look at the brett weinstein podcast and it kind of reinforces their thinking this is the this is the echo chamber that they want to be in and then they're like, yeah, let's support them because you know, yes. YouTube demonetized that, m- them. Yes. That must mean that you know, they're saying the truth. And well, what so, you just yeah. said makes me think of something. And I thought about this yesterday, and it's, it's not that poignant, but it's just that what you, what you just laid out, that people have an initial feeling, and then they want to justify their feelings. Oh. <laughs> so that's why they're, right? Because, again, these people yeah. are typically not scientific-minded. They're, they're not super intelligent or well-read on these subjects but yes they have a feeling oh i don't want to get everybody's got maybe they don't even know why they don't want to get the vaccine right it could be multiple reasons could be needles a fear of needles could be a mixture of things and then they like you said find these different things which are false like all these statements whatever it is like the two deaths for every three people saved these things that you've debunked with uh, uh you know many people are debunking that they're they've been saying you know now combine all that with that brett uh, has that history with academ- academia where he was let go of a job, right? And then his brother has a thing too, like a math thing that he saw that that, that, that they're not letting see the light of day. Like they have Physics, these chips yes, on their shoulder, you know, Physics. they have these, yeah, yeah. This, these chips on their shoulders that, uh, and the same with Dr. Malone, Robert Malone, he's, I invented the mRNA vaccine, but yet then people are saying, no, like a single person doesn't just invent the vaccine like that. That's not you. It's disingenuous to even say that. And then you go to his website, he's a consultant and you can hire him, blah, blah, blah. Like it's these people with these pride and ego problems, but pride and ego can blind us completely from sort of logic and, and facts sometimes. Right. Uh, yeah, we're, we're all victim to our own sort of pride in, in everyday situations even. So when it comes to these large topics, it's unfortunate that, you know, these things can result in harmful, you know, death and other things. Definitely. But, yeah. I think everybody's got an ego and it's just a matter of, you know, some people, their ego gets inflated kind of the longer they remain in the spotlight. Uh, it becomes kind of self-sustaining addiction. Like you can't, if you're putting out podcasts every week and you get all those followers and the comments, retweets and all that. Yeah. You can't, I think you just can't let go of it and you get captured by your audience. And again, the audience kind of then starts dictating the message. If you know, you started, started catering to dumb fuck anti-vaxxers, you can't just all of a sudden, you know, reverse your position 180 degrees when you actually learn that, wait a second, no, uh, all of the things I've been saying are wrong on vaccines, on exploding ovaries, on 
uh, all the dangers that it's not safe for women or the babies born with split brains. And you're like, no, all of this is fucking bullshit. Well, you can't, once you've been captured by your audience, you just can't admit to it. And uh, I don't know, expect not even like from a financial perspective, but from an ego perspective, I guess yeah. once you've kind of built yourself up to this guru with thousands of followers, you just can't bear the, 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 the embarrassment of saying, Shit, guys, I, I, I completely yeah. fucked up and misled you. I'm, I'm sorry you've been taking ivermectin for three months now. Go get fucking vaccinated or you're going to die like those other dumb fucks that listen to me. And to be fair, we know that they're vaccinated, right? Or have they mentioned no. that they're vaccinated? Oh, no. We don't know that. You haven't been following this one either, dude. They've been taking <laughs> ivermectin live on air. Well, Brett has been taking ivermectin live on air. And he's been boasting like, well, I'm not vaccinated, but I'm on prophylactic ivermectin, which is like oh, 100% okay. effective. If you uh, if you follow it, take it correctly, whatever. Uh, so yeah, he he then uh, tried to pressure. He took it live on air. He tried to pressure Heather taking it live on air. I think their son is actually yeah. like Heather argued with the doctor who suggested their son get vaccinated. He's like, no, we're gonna keep him on prophylactic ivermectin. So yeah, man. No, there are other substances or drugs that have shown even better evidence. No, uh, for possible covid prevention that like is there not a, a few no. things that are being studied that have had uh, there's nothing there's things being studied but not as a prophylactic i mean it's fucking stupid why do you want to study something if you got vaccines already sure like sure. there's nothing better yeah, i don't know like, why they're being studied but i know there are awesome. things being studied yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, it, they're it, basically the only reason they're taking ivermectin because they're scared of vaccines and scared for completely irrational unscientific reasons uh, but uh, there are things that are being studied as treatment because ivermectin, like you, sometimes people even conflate ivermectin as a prophylactic and as treatment. Like That's what I meant to say. Sick. I think I meant to say treatments. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's some things that, uh, you know, right now, uh, well, I mean, actually, if you, if, if you uh, think about it, I, I guess uh, fl fluoxamine or Prozac or SSRIs in general are kind of being st st studied as prophylaxis whether they could have some kind of prophylactic effect, but not for you getting sick. Like, you know, obviously Prozac is not going to help you not get COVID, but it can lower the potential uh, negative effects, the morbidity or even mortality. If you're in Prozac, potentially it's associated with reduced risks of both, uh, you know, getting hospitalized and, and mortality, but that's completely different. It's, it's not meant as pro ivermectin is to prevent, to yeah. preventative from infection. Yes. Right first and foremost and secondly it's it's also like supposedly uh it can be used as once you already get covid somehow it can supposedly reduce uh morbidity of of the of sickness and reduce the mortality risk and actually it does not it does not in properly conducted uh, randomized controlled trials there's been already like five or six like with a large sample size of thousands of people ivermectin is shown to be ineffective even maybe more dangerous because there was this Argentinian study uh, in like 600 people in each group that show that ivermectin actually might uh, be more dangerous for people who are hospitalized. They could get, they might require ventilation five days, five days sooner than people who are not ivermectin. So there's like that kind of uh, troubling signal, not even mentioning that, you know, taking ivermectin, weekly for months on end is completely unstudied and then verified that it's safe. No matter what Brett claims, there's no long-term study on this high dose of ivermectin being taken weekly. Nobody ever took it weekly. As a <laughs> deworming agent, as an antiparasitic, it was taken on either like uh, once a year, twice a year at most, four right. times a year. Nobody right. was ever taking this huge dose on a weekly basis. And, or now a bi-weekly basis. It's fucking Pierre Corey is now saying... Fucking Pierre Corey was saying that, oh, ivermectin is almost like 100% guaranteed to you not get COVID. And then Pierre Corey himself got COVID. He got Delta. And, you know, what was his messaging? Rather than say, fuck, I was wrong. Ivermectin is utter shit. Pierre Corey is like, oh, no, let's increase the dose and take I was going to say it didn't now. take enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 He's like, now he's recommending twice a week to take the iverme ivermectin on, under their protocol. You know, I'm happy. Uh, my my grandmother, for example, got the vaccine. She was a little trepidatious at first, but uh, she has her old uh, church 
lady friends that are messaging her saying to take ivermectin and stuff. So I'm glad that she has me to say, uh, you know, no, the vaccines are good enough. Um, where do people get ivermectin? Like health food stores or how do you even obtain it? Like I, off the I shelf? think no, like they take veterinary. I don't even know if ivermectin is approved for human use. In Underground Canada. alleyway, back alley. Well, I, I mean, they get it from, they get horse ivermectin or yeah, like dog ivermectin, <laughs> deworming agent for, for pets. And yeah, it's beyond ridiculous. Well, I guess you could probably get it from an online pharmacy in India or something, but I don't know where. Weird stuff, man. Um, yeah. So yeah, we covered a lot, but I don't know, in, in closing, I know there's this topic of Afghanistan, of course, and the Taliban taking over in a week. Now you tweeted a couple of tweets about, I don't know if you have any uh, geopolitical um, opinions or thoughts. Uh, are you into that? I mean, topic? who doesn't have opinions? <laughs> <laughs> They're sure. like assholes, right? Everybody's going. But uh, yeah, it's just, I mean, like everybody else, I'm pretty shocked and I guess appalled to see U.S. just abandon Afghanistan so quickly and just kind of how it, how many lives it will destroy that didn't need to be like Afghans, Afghan women who are now will be living under Taliban back to their like full burqas days. Right. It's, it's very disheartening. Uh, so and yeah. even like that that aside the whole idea not not idea the history of how it all came together like we you look back 30 years ago or even yeah mm -hmm. 40 years ago right right it's so old yeah <laughs> <laughs> but basically the idea that uh, how it all started was us uh, were kind of fanning the flames of islamic fundamentalism just to kind of get at the soviets who invaded afghanistan back then because i mean why did the soviets invade because it was a geopolitical game between like the Americans and CIA and actually not even necessarily the Americans, but maybe between the intelligence services, between CIA and KGB and CIA. Uh, basically, there was a revolution in Afghanistan in like in the 70s where it was a, you know, it was a religious country and there was a revolution that secular wanted to secularize it. Like, there's like fuck religion. Let's go back to not, not go back. Let's do what our neighbors to, to the north are doing in Soviet Union where it's a secular country, you know, women's rights, everything's great. And there also there's great thing called communism. Everybody's going to live like happily ever after. Of course, you know, reality with communism is not so rosy, but and uh, there was the, the biggest point of pushback, though, was from the religious people in Afghanistan. They're like, we don't want your secular government. We don't want our women to, to be free and have equal rights. We're, you know, we have this tradition, religious tradition. We want to do as we've been doing for centuries. And so they've been uh, uprising against the government and they were like within the government was infighting and then the CIA kind of supported the guy uh, who uh, killed his rival and got installed as like the head of Afghanistan. And this is when kind of Soviets were like, oh shit, we actually like the CIA is going to take over this country and we can't let it happen. And so they had their own uh, kind of Delta force fly in and kill that guy who got installed and then the Russian troops came in. Basically all to prop up this uh, secular government and actually like this that secular government before that coup he, they were asking the soviets to come in because the, there was some kind of you know uh, agreement like nato agreement or whatever if something happens afghanistan can ask the soviets to put the troops in they asked the soviets refused because they like they, they didn't want to they realized that this is going to be a fucking mess this war but anyways but they did the soviets came in and then the u.s had a brilliant idea why don't we just you know fan the flames of islamic fundamentalism create the mojihad not create mojihadin but like train up, the fund uh, them train, or them. Yeah. fund give them stinger missiles create osama bin laden into the figure that he became and they did all that you know the soviets got defeated the soviets left but that left kind of the vacuum that got filled up by all the Islamic fundamentalists who didn't know now they, they had to disappear magically when U.S. got in its way with the Soviets. And uh, it just, you know, propagated, propagated. Osama bin Laden and was like, why don't I attack the U.S.? They're infidels, if you're infidels as well. Let's yeah. just, you know, go after them. They'll run scared. They're paper tigers and stuff. Well, that didn't work out too well for him eventually. But, you know, to the world at large, to be kind of caught in this crossfire was also not very pleasant. Yeah. So now, now the U.S. has gotten the... Kind of Islamic fundamentalism in Afghanistan. They also kind of did a very similar thing in Iraq, with like they toppled the more or less secular government of Saddam Hussein. He wasn't, you know, he was a fucking asshole, but he at least he wasn't an Islamic fundamentalist blowing people up with the, you know, you know their martyr jihadist uh, suicide bombers. 
But mm. now they got that, they got ISIS, and all like it's all really a result of their shorthanded politics of fanning the flames of Islamic fundamentalism back in the 1980s. And now they've abandoned, like, even though like they went in, they defeated the Taliban, like it was a very fragile status quo, but at least it was a status quo. They had like a semblance of sec not secular, but like uh more or less equal government, Afghanistan, right. women's rights, and blah blah blah. It wasn't yeah. crazy religious. Uh, and you know, it was like there was some minor skirmishes, but really, like the Taliban weren't attacking the United States like they were attacking the the Russians when the Russians were there, or even like when there was an active phase in in Iraq, or like there, from what I understand, there wasn't a single American military death for over a year in Afghanistan. So it's not like it was a bloodbath that what they had to withdraw troops from. So, but it was just this sentiment that we need to stop nation building and get out of there and finish yeah, it's, sort it's, of tie so a bow on it. But it's, it's, all, it's, it's, all, it's all based on like polls of people. Well, you ask people when they don't really care, and there's yeah. like nothing going on. Like, do you support removal of troops from Afghanistan? Like, I haven't like, heard of that in, a while. in Afghanistan. Yeah. You're like, yeah, I guess. You know, why do we want to stay in that? Right, you know, right, right. Uh, War should old, end and uh, there's peace and love. Yeah, and love. but and actually, like, if you if they now if people were asked. Uh, do you support staying in Afghanistan? Yeah, if we could go if, back if a we week don't or two weeks. Endure, yeah, if we like, if if we if you know that when we pull out, there'd be Taliban this will happen. restore power. Would you still support staying in Afghanistan? I'm sure, like overwhelmingly, people would say, "Yeah, let's, let's we don't want another Taliban." You know, a, a Taliban-led Afghanistan in the world that we fought so hard to to kind of prevent, and so many deaths, American deaths, international deaths were paid for this price, and now they're all pretty much were in vain because we just left and it, we're back to square one or even worse. 20 years was it? Is em that... Emboldened. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like the September 11 attacks, 2001. Yeah, a long time. So yeah, people, it's, it's, it is like that, yeah, like we've thrown away what we've sort of gained in a sense and that we're back to square one. And do you see this as sort of a, a great Biden failure that he'll sort of have to live with? Um... I mean, Biden is a poster child for that failure, but I, yeah. I think it's it's like There's so a long much time more coming. than just, yeah. yeah it, it might even be like the American people pushing him to make that decision for like because of the polls and the sentiment, that, yeah, let's get out of Afghanistan. Of nobody actually thought through. Nobody has, like has any understanding of geopolitical problems in that region. To them, Afghanistan is just some distant thing that haven't hasn't been bothering them for I don't know twenty yes. or ten years. And they're like Afghanistan. We're still in Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah we're still exactly. in Afghanistan. I don't want to spend yeah. my taxpayer money on you know being right. in Afghanistan. Yeah, let's come back. But the like the ramifications of doing so are like so much worse and probably going to be like amplified tenfold and you have to spend then tenfold amount of money to deal with the consequences because we're we're not even like at square zero of what's the fallout of this you know taliban overtaking i think i don't i mean i don't want to sound like a cassander but i i think we're going to have a lot of problems because of this withdrawal like worldwide with uh, terrorism and fundamentalism in other parts of the world and yeah, that's what people are saying. I hope and, I'm know, wrong. But. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I guess you can never predict these things with a sort of crystal ball, but of course, uh, the opportunities yeah. are there for these, uh, you know, the Taliban, uh, ISIS, these types of things to flourish when you lose that foothold, right? Like everybody, yeah, it's a lot so of stupid. Yeah, this yeah. is like when you almost thought that like, ISIS is kind of on the ropes. Now you like <laughs> give the the Islamic fundamentals to another country. You're like, oh well, now you can have Afghanistan. You know, go experiment there with whatever. Yeah, I, I can program. understand the sentiment of people wanting to stop nation building after seeing the Iraq and Afghanistan, just wanting to let's stick it, let's stay home, yada yada yada. But the world is an interconnected place. Geopolitics is a reality of life and, and it's not like you can football. choose when you want to play nation building and like oh i don't want to play anymore yeah oh, yeah what? like you know, exactly people are still there and all the problems that were there in the beginning when you wanted to play they're still there and if you stop playing you're gonna have worse problems so it's just so short-sighted i think and it's it's very sad it's unfortunate yeah it definitely is but uh, Yuri, uh, we've taken a lot of your time today, but we've learned a lot. I think we covered a lot of topics. It was really great to talk to you and meet you. Um, where can people follow you? You're on Medium. You're on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Just, I guess, Twitter just if you up. want. Yeah, just Google me, whatever. Sounds good, man. Okay, well, take care and uh, great talking to you. All right. Likewise, thanks for having me. Enjoy Toronto. Enjoy the rest of your stay. <laughs> Will do. Okay, talk to you later. All right, bye.